favorite themes during all of his working time, which is the problem of time. Now, my, my, my job in introducing him is enormously easy because he is well, virtually allergic to introductions. So you just, uh, uh, the, the thing he likes most is not to be introduced. So if I can just, sort of just sit down and say, this is Cedric Price, and he's going to talk about time. In my view, I think that's probably the thing that he would like most. So. Correct. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> also, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late. Now, the um, question of the involvement, the, the, the introduction of time as the fourth dimension into architecture um, has been obvious since anyone had one wall, brick wall fall down. Um, so it's, it's nothing particularly new. However, in this, this series, I feel that it is worth discussing uh, time in relation to one of architectural, uh, one of one's architectural's most noticeable manifestations, which is the city. And I am extremely sorry that I missed the talk that precedes this one, because it would have been very useful to me, not only because it was by someone whose views interest me a great deal, but also it's by a city I know. This evening, in may, mainly in reference to a particular city, I should refer to London, which <laughs> at the AA, I know it's pushing it, but uh, at least a large minority might know. Um, <laughs> the reason for this is that this is one of, of two talks, and next week I shall speak about my reaction to the situation that I hope to define tonight. So tonight won't be necessarily constructive, except in your own minds and in the points that you raise uh, towards the end of the talk, which won't be very long. But primarily what I want to do tonight, uh, as was detailed in the blurb in the AA notes, and I'm sorry I'm out of breath, but that's why I missed the last talk through um, slight misunderstanding about when people would come to the office to see me. Um, tonight I'd like to clarify shared intentions. And the clarification is probably for my benefit as much as for yours. But I'd also like to illuminate uh, those uh, sort of areas where sharing can never occur <coughs> and that is important for you to contribute to. It's not on the assumption that I think I may be wrong, it's on the assumption that you think I may be wrong. In the um, AA blurb, I'm trying something tonight which I... <laughs> every talk, unless one tapes it, as far as I'm concerned, every talk should be a, as an enjoyable experiment for the person giving it as it may be agonizing for those listening. And so whereas I normally have similar sized cards, I thought tonight, because everything is different size, it would enable me to have something to say about whatever I pick off the top of the pile. <laughs> but I've cheated, because I've put this one at the top. In the blurb about cities and time, I've already said why I think it's important to think about that. I haven't said it tonight, but I've written it in the blurb. But degrees of uh, acceptance of the truth should be considered that is that uh, it, it's not all about truth as such. Certainly if we're talking about uh, 
useful prediction or indeed um, amenable extrapolation, then in fact the truth is already brought in, into question. Now for phrases, that which once worked but now doesn't, but is assumed for convenience to do so, should be taken in our stride. There are others. That which never worked, never will do, but is always assumed to do so, should be questioned. And there are others less moral than that, such as that which never worked, doesn't work now, probably won't work in the future, but all of us like to think that it does, should be accepted. <laughs> Postage stamps. Think of that one and why they were invented. And how mine always seem to tear in half if I buy large sheets of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to do with Sod's Law, probably. Um, In uh, 1961, at the DIA conference, DIA probably isn't known of now, Designers in, Indus Designers in Industry Association. I, I spoke at their annual conference, 1961, in the Haymarket, on office buildings. And I found the quote. The design and construction of the office building should be seen as part of a process, not as the realization of a product. The aim of such process is individual prosperity, not an office block. As an example, the aim of the process of good food husbandry is good health, not a fine meal. We age. Where's that ashtray? I asked why anyone got it. No. No, it doesn't matter, Mr. Chairman. It doesn't matter, Mr. Chairman. Now, this whole thing about. Ah, oh, thank you. No, that's the matches next. <laughs> I might add that I, I agree with all that the danger of passive smoking and everything. And I am going to the farewell party of David Simpson, an old friend of mine, who is president of Ash on Monday. And he don't, won't stop me smoking because he doesn't like to treat me like a vicar would. Now, work that's been done, or is, is being done, by a number of persons, including Robertson Ward, who some of you may know, the architect of the SCSD school system, that image-making school with the helicopter landing the Lennox air condition on the roof, which thousands of architects have used since, since its advent in the very early, six, late 50s, 60s. Well, it's still an architect and still producing. Ezra Aaron Krantz, give everyone their credit, they'll fade off later on in the evening, the credits that is, uh, wrote the uh, performance specification for their school system, which was won by Inland Steel, architect Robson Ward, and was funded, the original installation, by Education Facilities Laboratories. Now, one thing he's working on at the moment, which I find very interesting, and is very similar to, to a lot of work that, that uh, uh, Frank Duffy is doing as well. And I, in, in fact, I think this quotation was given at a conference by Robson Ward at, at a conference that Frank Duffy chaired. But it's, in fact, about office building systems, performance, and functional user costs. So we're still on that product that office. <coughs> Functional use costs, primarily human costs, constitute the largest component of organizational costs. Yet these costs are seldom included in life cycles costing of buildings. 
Now, I've been guilty of that. I've talked about design costs, construction costs, assembly costs, uh, um, uh, installation costs, commissioning costs, occupational costs, maintenance costs, clearance costs, storage costs, demolition costs. I've talked about those, but I haven't really talked about the uh, human costs involved during that process. Time. The performance classes for elements of office building systems are proposed in relation to their potential effect on functional use costs. The economic value of performance improvement due to one class is much greater than that due to the other. And this sensitivity ratio can be quantified. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you find that the cleaners are the most important element in the building you've been designing for three years. But it does mean that you have to realize that they are there, and that wages are there, and the people employed in the building may be unemployed in the building because of the wiring in the building changing, and people will have to pay their, pay their pensions or their redundancy. So the building itself is, is causing an equation in time of costing which has to be measured, which must be known to the architect. Now, that's just an office building, not a city. <coughs> now, my concern with, with the city is that very often, once you stick a lot of things together for a very long time, that its justification is, is uh, made through the fact that it is present, that it is there. Not just in the question of maintaining it because, my word, it's beautiful, or maintaining it because it's a bit of a worry to think up designing another Milton Keynes ten times as big and moving Islington and Camden the hell out of here. Not just because that, but because of a sort of sleuth that is induced in the community by the products that we the architects produce. Because at the time we produce them, we think this is the one and only. Oh yes, of course in time we talk about flexibility, adaptability, variation. Now and again a few of us, like myself, talk about fixed lifespans, cost of demolition, ease of demolition, advantage of clearing a space for someone else, not the original God-sent architect, or indeed the original God-sent client, for someone else to think, Phew, I can have a think over a few years while that building is there in what we can use the space for again. But is that done collectively? Unlikely. Now, why is that unlikely? Why do uh, generations of plans and good causes appear to founder on a load of dross that we call the city as found, or the great when. Nineteen thirty-six. Damn the Thames, a matter of sanitation, comfort and economy. The very first paper a uh, very first booklet to suggest a tideless Thames. Not the Thames barrage. Don't confuse it with that. That's to stop flooding. A tideless Thames. And what were the reasons given? Sanitation, comfort, and economy. Now, if you think of a tideless Thames now, if one of you, age 60 or 26, thinking, ah, I'll do a scheme for the tideless Thames, would you try and justify it to your client or unit master on sanitation, comfort, and economy? <laughs> Another collector's piece. Greater London, the very first regional planning committee ever, long before the Greater London Plan. But 
price five shillings, December 1929. Now, what were the aims of this committee? And who brought it together? Well, the aims were quite simple and listed somewhere where I can find them. Here they go. Let's consider the complex problems presented by the tasks assigned to them. Therefore, they saw it as a problem. Time. There was the city, a committee of worthy people. Suddenly, look, we've got a city, must be problems, complex problems. And uh, special uh, attention has been given in regard to the following items. Decentralization of industries, open spaces, green belts or belts around London, and ribbon development on main roads. End of sentence. Second sentence. The question of Chang Cross Bridge has received special attention. Full stop. End of the aims. <laughs> ah, ah, now, watch it, though. Because we laugh, you see. <laughs> Chang Cross Bridge, special attention. But, all of a sudden, today, published, Labour Party's blueprint for London, new <coughs> metropolitan... Someone fill in the words for me. No better than me. Metropolitan something. It's like LCC, but it, it's MCC. Anyhow, it doesn't matter what the title is. I'll find it in a minute. Anyhow, what are they, what are they saying? Amongst their things, remember that, that one, 1929? As claims the Labour Party, is this business of, generally speaking, it won't be involved with detailed planning, this, this authority to succeed GLC, except for city-wide, items of city-wide, see it, two-dimensional still, not time, city-wide importance, e.g. Spitterfields. Well, I think Charing Cross Bridge is more important than Spitterfields. Spitterfield is only important at the moment because someone found it wasn't important quicker than the rest of the pack. <laughs> Yum, 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 they thought. Let's try Spitterfields for a bit of, of quick currency note printing. But now it's, it's entombed in policy of the great and the good. <coughs> so I like Spitterfields. Bring it in. We'll really think about it. Now this business of the side effects, the, the side products, not the immediate results of what we do, but the one or two things removed from what we do is primarily what I want to talk about. Let's take uh, Gibbon. Decline and fall of the Roman Empire. If we if I paraphrase, as I've done before, hmm. Gibbon's reasons for why Rome collapsed. He said it wasn't what people thought, it wasn't all the Goths and all those. And he, he summarised it as the, ev this was in the order of, of importance he gave to it. Not me. the eventual fragility of all constructions. Religious dislike of heathens. The value of scrap. 
last and most potent, the domestic hostilities of the Romans themselves. Now, back to the business of spin-off and not worrying too much. What I'm trying to say is that predictions and extrapolations by architects and planners are being proved faulty all the time. And that's why I quoted those, those two different cases, three different cases over a period of 35, 45 years. I don't think feedback from uh, uh, Suckett and C sort of theory of, of, uh, of um, you know, it's theory of someone, but this business of, uh, well, well, let's check what's going on. Oh, Ruth Glass, <laughs> and her benefit, she did more effective things with Suckett and C than even Wilmot or Young. But I don't think that is, is quite sufficient. I think primarily what one's got to look at is, is continuing, not particular, but continuing responses to secondary and tertiary byproducts of what is done. Now, that fellow who was here the other night, um, I recommend that, that book or his talk, Mike Davis. Because he, he, in a way, I'm not sure he even, well, he probably did. But what he did was he didn't bother with the um, succit and see, let's see what works and what doesn't work, and we'll check that out and do better next time. Or let's predict, you know, let's do an Ebenezer Howard or a, or a William Morris, the ideal city, uh, because that, that's sure to iron out all we thought about. But he actually investigated secondary and tertiary byproducts of what had already been done and, and how actually it affected not only the validity of what was, what was built but the unimportance of what was built. And therefore you find in his account several cities and townships around the, in, in the greater Los Angeles city area with, with moving names, you know, like Humerville and all that, um, you find some, for quite extraordinary non-architectural reasons, often uh, tax conveniences, money reasons, return on, 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 on pulling down one industry and replacing it with another, federal grants, you know, central government grants, whatever, uh, and the need to maintain a particular level of uh, electorate, i.e. numbers of people who can vote in a particular area to keep the pot boiling and just think about why and who better to criticize the Labour Party than a great supporter of it, like me, but just think about why uh, London, is, why there is a, f a feel for a need for a political uh, centrality of London. However, uh, maybe a bit cynical me, not Mike Davis, he pointed out that the secondary and tertiary reasons in some of these townships was that old age pensioners had their houses painted free every two years. That nervous persons could in fact require uh, someone to walk them back home even from a bar at night. <coughs> that Children were reminded that they could have uh, a free ride, not only to school, but to their favorite place of play on a Sunday or out of school times. Now, even, even, even the burghers of, of Islington, Camden, anywhere else, hadn't thought up as much as this. Regular. Hey, social trends, 1991. An awful handout phrase, leisure. Leisure is always that which you hope, the governors hope, 
the time spent in leisure can be organized by them, by those who suddenly find themselves with that time, so at least they don't misbehave. That's why it's never called pleasure. Any government publication, always leisure. <laughs> I need a drink. I can't read a thing tonight. <laughs> Have you noticed? It is, it's nothing to do with old age. Have you noticed a lot of government publications now, because they produce things in broadsheet, then produce it in bound form uh, just by reducing it, rather like British Rail's new catalogue? Which isn't, it is more difficult to read because it's that much smaller. Because they produce broadsheets and then think, oh, well, we'll take it down to A4. That's my excuse, anyhow. Now listen, leisure. Women in full-time employment, 1991, women in full-time employment enjoy an average of 33 hours of leisure time per week, 11 hours less than men similarly employed. So every week <laughs> there, there is just under 50% of the population got 11 hours more to do with the spare, more, 11 hours more spare time than the other 50% of the population. Now, what sort of city does that design? Can you compensate that by having a sex check on tourists? <laughs> Byproducts. You know, who pays for going out? Lovely 60s. Was the advert produced? Site immediately next. There's lovely buildings by Ron Heron, which I will fight to preserve to the death. The Hayward Gallery, the Elizabeth Halls, those. Right next to the site, back next. The LCC, as it then was, advertised the site for grabs to the developers. Glossy thing. Actually, Ted Cullinan had to break one day, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh... I, I, I thought it was Dennis Crompton who you hadn't given credit to. I'm keeping an eye on him. <laughs> and Dennis Scott. And see. Bloody sharp tonight, aren't you? Yeah. You can go off things. <laughs> I've lost. I'm not going to try this experiment again. It doesn't quite work. There was a marvellous little thing about offering it. Ah, here we are. There's the site. Hayward, Royal Festival Hall, car park. <laughs> right. It is intended that the development of the site should include a hotel of about a thousand room bedrooms associated with an entertainment center, a convention center, shops, residential, and other pro approved uses, but underlined, not office development, 1961. The project would require most careful consideration for civic design point of view. There is a call for a simple solution, possibly, but not necessarily, in the form of a low podium with an hotel rising from it. <laughs> You know, how, how to, how to gain the competitions. Now, this, this nature of, of slightly sort of, I hope what I'm getting across to you is that in a way, the uh, prediction and indeed the suck it and see uh, system of uh, the futures game which because of the time cycle we have to be in, because we produce one of the oldest products in the futures game, one of the slowest uh, to respond to change, 
Because don't worry about, you know, oh, well, the instantly flexible interior, the wonderfully available capacity to change with the sunlight through, through our photosensitized skin and to, to whiz around uh, the, the cabling, the partitions, the furniture inside. All that, all that flexibility just puts the onus for dying structurally on where the bloody building is put in the first place. So no you say, oh, you have the front door anywhere. You know, it's in a podium. <laughs> it's dark lock. <laughs> it's on high. Oh, no, don't worry about that. It's right. <laughs> it happens to be on some mud flats north of Slough <laughs> with, with a few shooting range type swords of green and a, a security bay. You know. So it um, the flexibility sort of just moves down the, moves down the line a little bit. Um, if in fact, oh, let, let's 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 do a bit more on the city. I've never really known, and I've no doubt that Roy, and his sort of now he's got his tail up, will correct me. What genius loci <laughs> means? But I'm going to use it for the way I want. <laughs> Later, yes, before the second talk. Thank you very much, yes. Right. <clears throat> I talk about, uh, let, let's finish with that location thing. That as, as you have inbuilt flexibility, then still in relation to the city, <laughs> someone's noticed the time, um, you, 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 have, you have a new inflexibility, you have a new constriction, which is actual location. Now, of course, one thing that is a bit sad in relation to uh, city planning is location, never mind fourth dimension time, location, unfortunately, constantly appears to be nothing more than two dimensions. That is, that uh, far more so than, than London, for instance, 100 years ago, the, the interest or concern or realization of the enormous potential of what happens below ground is, is, is largely ignored. So we talk about heights and things like that, but there, there isn't a sort of feeling that, that we're rapidly filling up, misusing, crossing over, or underusing what happens below ground level. Now, when I say ground level, I mean water level as well. So that, that's on the location thing. But on the junior loci in relation to the history of, history of London. Um, oh, I don't, I can, re I can remember it. Um, there are one or two uh, usefulnesses that were afforded to a city, and this is why. I, you, you, who were lucky enough to go to the lecture earlier tonight, can, can update this, because some of the uh, uh, advantages of Chicago, like being the best best way, I, I'm sure you've heard the history of the stockyards and the corn belts and the lakes, all those, those useful locations, London only had in a sort of small way. It was where the Romans could cross the, the, uh, the Thames, holding their scutai high so they didn't rust, uh, and, and uh, they could walk in formation across the Thames. They could ford the Thames at London. It was the first fordable point and get north to get at the rest of them. Um, so the, the whole business of, about river crossing is important, location. But that is hazard. That's overcoming a hazard. Not saying, oh, what a lovely river. Oh, <laughs> what a smashing old river. Water tastes good here, three miles up from South End. Let's, let's stop here, Claudius, and have a city, you know. My word, we might, we might put down a few wells. No, no. When they were looking for water, they went to Gloucestershire and things where they could find fresh, fresh water and lots of sheep. But London was, was convenient <laughs> across the thing. Then you go on a bit longer, and <laughs> you, you have various questions of defence. Because once someone's find a crossing, all the, unfort all the, all the unwelcome people would try to cross at that point. So you, you control that for a start. And it's very interesting that, that London Bridge, 
was the only crossing above water for 400 years. Worth bearing in mind, he said. Then there was this whole business of, of uh, defense, keeping the goodies to yourself. Uh, Tower of London, I, keeping the jewels there, keeping the government there, etc., keeping the constabulary there, etc., etc. So the amassment, rather than believing in the computer printout, the amassment of, of, uh, of, of wealth in a secure place was another good reason for, for a city. The exchange of wealth in a handy place, you know, slapping the old palm or whatever it was, you know, if a word is your bond and things like that. Admittedly, it hap had happened in Rome, but in, in England, it, it, it required places, of course, the first where it happened was, was uh, first of any importance was Winchester, and the next one, I suppose, was, was Bristol. But London was early in the, early in the trade of, of passing bonds, of, of passing uh, trust and belief rather than actual goods through actually being there, being together. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that, uh, as most of you would have learned last night through listening to the same program that I did, in uh, 1200, the uh, uh, government of this country, which is largely a, a royal government, uh, used 33 pounds of sealing wax per year and by 1350, they used 330 pounds of, in weight of sealing wax per year. Now, of course, sealing wax was the way you actually sealed an agreement. Now, it, it's, it, it's worth bearing in mind that those, those businesses, because the whole business of exchange of trust was a very good generator for the maintenance of the city, not for its establishment. Right. Then, of course, you find other things which are a bit rum, that, that <coughs> when, when back to the byproducts, dangerous byproducts. I mean, the, the interesting thing, I wish I had heard the Chicago thing, the whole thing about building up Lake Lake Shore Drive by, by bringing rubbish at low level in the railway, clearing out the rubbish for construction, put it in the Lake Shore, and then in it waving it. I don't know if this is true, but I don't want any correction. Then having uh, a low level railway line to be able to bring in coke and coal to heat the, the boilers of the multi story blocks that could then go up, thanks to Mr. Otis and the rest. Um, I know, and uh, you know, because Monadnock uh, did have did have a lift even before it had steel. So isn't that all brick? Yeah. Right, so that sort of uh, uh, building up because of, of what else is going on is, should be watched in relation to, to uh, acceptance of the amenable. I'm sorry I've not turned out this way. To apologise. <laughs> it's the way they put it. I'm, I'm a little old man now. I can't read <laughs> bloody things. Um, the whole the whole business of uh, the amenity value of of continuity, which again is about time in architecture, and therefore the history of the immediate past is often worth looking at, however painful. Um, the Isle of Dogs was a sort of a rather rude-shaped uh, peninsula, which was about to become, which was, was, was going to be a formation of an oxbow lake, all which, you know, so the river was cutting out the south side, depositing on the north side. And that's why it was easy to, to break across. In fact, in the tideless Thames, there were schemes for taking the Thames right across the top of the Isle of Dogs. But it was, it was really developed by, uh, you know, in the 18th, 19th, 18th century, the first ones were built, for these, uh, these docks in what was nothing more than a sort of marshland neck to the bottom of the, of the curve of the river. Um, as the docks were built, they automatically drained that land, and it became more and more amenable for, for 
further more sophisticated docks and for, for warehousing, because everything was moved by horse. And therefore, you couldn't really stack up great train loads of goods. It was better to have warehouses and to have the 24-hour um, clomp clomp of old Neddy pulling the things out on individual carts. So the whole institution of construction on, on the Isle of Dogs uh, required, um, <coughs> amongst most, the employment of, of cheap labor. And as always in those days, unfortunately, uh, they looked to Ireland. So the Irish navvy, who then would further be employed in, in digging canals and then railway cuttings, was, was used in the docks and was housed, and when in fact uh, was housed where they worked. Now it wasn't a nice place to live, the Isle of Dogs. I lived there once in Havana Street in the 50s, late 50s. It ain't nice. It isn't even nice now. It's foggy, wet, and cold. Uh, however, cubits, when, when labor got organized, this is a very potted history to just make one little point. However, Cubitt's town was built, which was actually named after the builder who employed the people who lived there, Cubitt's town. And the whole thing is, it was always a rather second-rate cheap area, but it was useful because you get ships in and out because the river almost met, so you could have two-way docks. Nothing more than that. That was all. And they were boats of particular size, which can't even get up the river now. So it is a bit absurd when a couple of, 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 of Canadian developers come along and build something. You know, well, there's a man called, an American called be, Flying Travel Step, Bedstead, Travel Step. But anyhow, if I, what I'm talking about is Canary Wharf. So there you get this enormous growth of office buildings, which I've, we've talked about a little earlier. I'm talking more detail in the second talk when I talk about what I think about office building. Um, however, this enormous development, which, which most people object to, which various logic, I don't say the they object to the architecture, but the, the top heaviness of the thing, it may work, it may not. It may revitalize London as trading center of Western Europe. We've got a big lump of Eastern Europe moving in with some spare sites as well at the moment, <laughs> on rather better rivers than the Thames, but never mind. There's a, um, however, the point is that there are, uh, there are sort of, um, shall we say, 50-50% views as to the uh, viability, I don't mean economic, but I would say even economic possibly, but the social viability or indeed desirability of Canary Wharf. But it's there, they build it, they've topped out and there it is, now they're letting off the space to, to uh, you know, really key people like uh, Pan Am and Midland Bank. Um, uh, the, the, po the point about this, what, what I'm talking is about, about being, being very cautious about ignoring secondary and tertiary causations, is in, in, in the newspaper this week, I read... Um, Oh, it's about, that's right, it's about putting the Olympics on the Isle of Dogs. <laughs> I mean, there's Irish, I mean, you know, it, it would never be all that easy to get to and get out of, as the pilots of the London Airport will tell you as they burn their engines out over Black Heath Hill. But, having, but, but now Canary Wharf, in a way, is history, indeed. When it started, before it started, all the uh, leather-elbowed, tweed-jacketed architects of Blackheath went out with their cameras on, onto uh, uh, Blackheath itself and photographed the Isle of Dogs, which they never looked at before, and then did little drawings and said, look how horrific the tower will look. It'll you know, you're ruining the backside of the Queen's house the backside of the Royal Palace of, of uh, Greenwich, and God knows how many uh, sort of un, unattended 
<coughs> un <coughs> unused uh, Wren and Hawksmoor churches up, up toward, on, on uh, West India Dock Road and things like that. And they probably made a good point. And so, but still, so they built it. <laughs> Protest, but they built it. Then, a short passage of time, another developer came across, across with another architect and designed some sail-like offices in front of, of Canary Wharf. Funny shaped ones, not those sort of um, catafalque like things that, that uh, Pele and his young middle age has moved into, but uh, wiggly, wobbly things, you see? Well, just as I say, I mean, they were different and things. No, they were objected to as possibly destroying the image of Canary Wharf, <laughs> detracting from this fine, stalwart image of the new, reborn commercial city center of Europe. <sighs> Can't have any of that flat, all oh, that stuff in front. Looks so we weren't serious about the other thing. That's only two or three years. And now we read in this newspaper, it's no use, I can't get mad, I can't read. <laughs> what was this? Was it a drink? Or was it paste? Here we go. <laughs> I can't find it. Now we read. This is this is this is this is putting you remember I did a scheme which only half with Hans Holley, which was stopped because of the bombers at, at where was it? Munich. This is, this is a thing for, for the Olympics in the Isle of Dogs. Oh, I, can't, I can't think of a better place for it. The Olympics, it, it could give Lundus, London spineless docklands on that site. It could, uh, and I, uh, sorry, it could give spineless docklands, London's spineless docklands, an ideal site for London's Olympic Village. The infrastructure has always, the infrastructure it has always lacked, particularly in terms of public spaces, <coughs> public buildings, and pu public housing, and public transport. So, what do you do now? You say, ah, oh, well, now it's there, we'll spend more. <laughs> now it's there, we'll spend more. We'll put some tubes in, we'll put some parks in, then we can persuade the Irish navvies to come back and live there, and we'll have a new infrastructure, and it'll make, it'll put a spine back into an area of spineless London. Now, who's helping who? Are we, are we, is that what we're going to do with Spitterfields? Is that what we're going to do with every city? Saying, by God, the poor old place is worn out, or it was inappropriate, or it was put in the wrong place in the first time. We said, now we'll put spine in it. Now we'll get some public thing in it. Now we'll make it a real city. Is that how cities should grow? Is that, is that, if it is, Salisbury would never have moved from all Sarum. Now, it moved from Old Sarum, cathedral and all, because the Romans didn't like the weather. <laughs> they put it in the wrong place. Lock, stock and barrel, it was moved down the hill. But no, we didn't say, no, I don't mind the fog and things, all air conditioned in, in, in Cesar's tower and things now. Let's get a few undergrounds in, a few public parks, you know, dog shit alley and all that. <laughs> Oh, that was Junius Luca. I mustn't go on much longer. This is going to be a big discussion. Um, just, I do. I do think that the um, there is a there is a a disregard at our costs, not just the architects, at all of our costs as citizens, of of the increasingly rapid change in demography, and not just in the actual numerical changes in demography of how old people are, but back to that business about all those men getting another <coughs> 11 hours of leisure every week. All that. 
they, these things change very, very quickly. Now, if architecture doesn't respond, and I'm suggesting that it certainly doesn't respond by putting spines in it, then, in fact, we must be very careful where we put architecture and for how long. And let us then start determining what is a city. It may be somewhere where everyone has the same credit card. Who knows? Um, the... Uh, No, leave that for the next one. Right, I think, I think what I'd do, cut it down a bit, I didn't realise I was going quite so long. Two things, one is, when, when I talked about process rather than product, I was talking about process, I introduced, as, a, as the sort of intellectual spit that I am, I introduced the sort of work that people like Frank Duffy and, and Robson Ward have been doing for years. I introduced in that process the whole process of, of the, the actual operation or misoperation of architecture because it happens to be there, or city because it happens to be there. And I just like to raise turning back on ourselves as, as architects, that, that we must also realize, and, and both, I'm sure, Duffy and Robson Ward and the rest have pointed out that if you take something as archetypal, and if for, for, for the decade or for the, the 50 years, half a century, something as archetypal as a building type, as an office building, then indeed, uh, they will have pointed out that as far as the architecture and the investment in it and the cost and the time, the actual architecture itself, the actual structure, the actual nature, the materials, the cladding, the windows, the pavement, the front doors, the roof or anything, is increasingly minute amount of the cost of that building over the time. Even if you take out what is the most uh, important usage, I, uh, most important cost, which is the functional cost, that is the people who are in it, even if you take that out, then you will find that the standard carpet, the standard furniture, the standard air conditioning, the lighting system, uh, the fire alarms, security, uh, flooring, wall surfacing, the rest is, is becoming an enormous amount of what is considered by the majority of the architectural profession, and probably rightly so, as not only not under their control, but not of their concern. But having said that, you've then got to realize that the manufacturers of such equipment are less and less going to be interested in the architect's demands made on them as opposed to the client's demands made on them, or indeed the user's demands made on them through the clients because the clients realize that they can only have those users should they reflect their demands of the day, of the week, of the month, not of the five years ahead when that building is going to be finished. So again, it is economic sense, not to listen too much to architects. Now, therefore, the, the, the role of architects in relation to cities, because I've already suggested that they look too seldom and at their own expense underground, um, is, is such that the people on whom they feel they can still call the present-day equivalents of Cubits, the Langs, the McCampines, the Bechtels, whatever, are also going to say, uh -uh, hold on, we can go on as we, as we were. We, we're not really, they'll, they'll take anything. They don't get put a pyramid on the top, but you know, don't change the steel section. Now, 
What is worrying is that, and this is a, a, a national thing, what is worrying that I feel, and it'll be interesting to see how many architects turn up at this conference later this month on the whole alteration to, to the design of steel that these proposed EC regulations on, on protection of steel against fire are going to make. I bet there will be very few architects there. However, I just thought, just before, <coughs> it hasn't quite finished, it's going to go on a bit longer. There'll again be pictures in a minute. Um, if you add together the total cost, private, uh, that is government and business investment in research and development in the construction industries in 1987, and I'll give it you as a percentage of the gross money spent on construction in that same year. In Germany, research and development, government and private, was 0.47%. I've told you wrong. It was 0 0.70%. 0 0.7%. In France, it was 0.41%. In England, UK, it was 0.21%. So half France, a third of Germany. And if you take Japan, where the government will not release figures on their investment in the construction industry, take Japan just on the business investment, that was 0.47%. So that was well over twice the English thing. So when we talk about cities, even if we're talking about the fabric of cities, it's worth bearing in mind that the United Kingdom might not be a very good place to build them. Because <laughs> you might not get the builders you would like. Now, then you have to go back to my Romans with a scutai, my kings saving their diamonds, my, my grain merchants or wool merchants wanting to do a deal without bringing the bloody sheep into Cheapside, etc., etc. You then have to decide who really calls the tune as to what cities are about. Long before you start saying cities are a good place to live because there's a choice of schools, I'm afraid. So once again, it may be that uh, in relation to time, we should uh, think about, not alternatives, but about brilliant variations to cities, which will occupy the entire contents of my second talk, because they'll all be related to work we have been doing. So I'll finish this first part with a quote. Time hath my lord a wallet at his back, wherein he puts If I get this wrong, can I say oh no. <laughs> it's a bad zero. Probably guess it's probably no snow. You're warming up the projector, I hope. <laughs> Time hath, my lord, a wallet at his back, wherein he puts arms for oblivion, a great-sized monster of ingratitudes. Those scraps are good deeds past, which are devoured as fast as they are made. Forgot as soon as done. It's one man's definition of time. Sides, please. Oh, one, one. Where's the one? You just turn them off. I turn them off? Yeah. 
Right. <laughs> it must be nice, you know. It's it's second childhood. It's dotage, isn't it? So help me, I can't do the switch. Yeah. Oh, the right-hand side is, is uh, the beautifully restored gardens of the Crystal Palace, which you all go to see if you live in, in uh, um, London. But if you live and die in Death Valley, that's all you might leave, is your car and your house, which you replace for better car and house as you grew up, and then you died. <laughs> And, and that, that uh, 15 years ago, what, no, 25 years ago, was Britain's most beautiful village on the left. And it's owned by one man, he's just let it rot. Um, right hand side, and they decided that had to go too. Still one of my favorite conglomerate buildings, Quarry Hill Flats, Leeds. That's it uh, going up backwards on the left. That was the wonderful brace. This was one of the first uh, lift portal frame systems in the country, 30s. It was only pulled down really because the cover over the reinforcement, secondary structural reinforcement, was falling out, the walls were coming out. It's been replaced now, I think, by public park. Um, oh, there was uh, RIV, there was a a theatre or something. And then it had laundries and people, and they didn't have to use buses. Oh, there's a bus station, that's right. They were 5,000 people there, right in the centre of Leeds. They didn't need buses. Never mind, it's gone. That's it coming down, photographed by me on the left. And that was the thing that, that uh, never stayed up by Melvin Charney, that uh, he was asked to do something for some... Um, Canadian is, Canada is beautiful exhibition in Montreal or somewhere. And that was a listed building on the right, and therefore he thought he'd build a facade of it on the left, have two of them. And they, thought, they paid him off, thought he was very cheap, and, and destroyed it before the exhibition started. <laughs> and that's a famous market in a famous Scottish town where the poorest of the poor could sell one shoe and decide to hop and things like that <laughs> and not be, not be spotted by the others because of the power of the Kirk. And then that was a rather unfortunate illustration produced in a, in a book by a very good left-wing architect just before the troubles blew up in the 30s. Next. There's one of the best, well certainly the best commercial building uh, Lutchins ever did for the old fated Midland Bank. And there is the bridge that was never built by the old fated Paul Ferris, which contained um, apartment buildings in the hangars to the bridge. What's happened? <laughs> Shh. Oh, this should be fun. Why? why? Oh, fuck that. <laughs> I have no idea where I am now. <laughs> going forward all the time. How will I go back? <laughs> See if I can get anyone that I recognise. This is fun, isn't it? Ah, oh, no. How do I get the one on the left onwards? You want that one? That one. And that one back? No. Uh, <laughs> they were terribly. Yeah. <laughs> No. Oh. Was that it? Yes. Okay. Ah! <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I, I hope Mummy's here to take me home. Um, there's the. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Don, for this tree. <laughs> Wherever he's gone. That's the. If, if somebody went to the. Uh, uh, Rainer Banner Memorial Lecture the other night. Um, it was very interesting that here was this man talking about 50s and 60s motor cars, but he photographed them all in, in scrap heaps. 
um, which were, was quite moving, but it was nostalgic, whereas the one thing about cars of that age, they were, nothing, they were, they were not nostalgic. They, they were quite naughty and exciting, and best uh, seen highly polished, lit up, and then lost, which is the Ford Fairlane there. And it interests me about another ill-fated company, Pan Am, the moment trying to sell its little lot on London Airport mud. Um, and that's a photograph by me. I see the day that I used to take photographs. Um, and that's the Sarinan thing. It's, I think it's rather a pity that building's still around. I think it should have gone with the fair lane when, when Pan Am started going. It's really rather a rather tragic little thing. And people would start saying, was it a church, you know? Was there, was there a Spaniard involved? Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all rather sad. And um, I don't know, I mean, I, I, fortunately the expert might spill it back. I don't really know whether, this is over um, Billy Gates Bar in Chicago, David. I don't know whether that bridge across was uh, because they, they built the first building too small and needed some more space. Well, <laughs> it looks as though they suddenly decided to be even grander and thought, Christ, we'd better cross at the 17th floor as well, the 11th floor. <laughs> and, um, the building on the, on, on the right, I think, should have been pulled down before the local planning authorities allowed uh, them to put... Uh, it's probably occupied by an architect. He probably does clever restorations in Suffolk. <laughs> <laughs> probably a member of the 30s group. I, I think you have to put holes in a roof that's actually to keep out the light and the rain from the grain, and you should pull the thing down. <laughs> But I don't mind illusion. I love this, the, these barns on the left, which are just painted. It's like about classical arch, literally arch, <laughs> painting. And that, that rather the nicest view I've ever had of, of uh, Nelson's column on the right. <laughs> it's all in the mind, though. This is the building I was first introduced to by that distinguished uh, intellectual uh, professor Royston Landau. Uh, it's a big, big hole in the ground, cheddar. And it, it probably is still one of the most impressive factories and testing stations, high-tech testing stations in the country. The only thing is the things they test don't require a roof over it. So rather than building a high building, they found a deep hole, equivalent height. And uh, where people were housed, they could be housed quite happily in little, um, little sheds around this place because it's... Primarily, they watch things with, with cameras and uh, um, test gauges, and everything is cable controlled except the erection of the things that are being tested for destruction, which you can see in the hole. And indeed, they have to stand up to all weathers if they succeed, because that's what they're testing for. So it's far better to build them in a test shed that doesn't have a roof over them than pretend to put in bad rain and winds in a building. So it has, it has all those nice compliments that, that uh, a park that isn't locked at night has in the middle of a city. The building on the right hand side, I just think one of the most idyllic buildings in this country. So there's no excuse to put it in, except I'm always delighted to see it. It doesn't matter when it was built. It's just a terrace house on a sloping hill with an absolutely immaculate three-dimensional grid. And that, unfortunately, is uh, a result of uh, city, city planning and uh, the fact that we don't realize that uh, putting a lot of people together who don't agree with each other, religiously or otherwise, <coughs> might, might cause death and not health. On the left-hand side in Belfast, and on the right-hand side in Trenton, Stoke-on-Trent, is the ultimate uh, a recognition of death if you happen to be the Duke of Sutherland. I just think it's the most marvelous mausoleum in the country. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you have to teach people to read English, to read those sort of signs, I'd rather they were illiterate. And there we go, optimism on the left, <laughs> and uh, 
<laughs> Looking forward to my lecture next week on the right. <laughs> now, that's it. Questions? A discussion? Oh, it's not that late. It's up to you, Chairman. People are sliding up like, like rabbits from a thief. When we first started talking about uh, giving a couple of sessions on time, Cedric did say, well, look, I think it would be rather nice if we were a very small group and that we were all just sort of chat to each other. So we're actually a little bit bigger than you initially anticipated. But all the same, I think it would be good if we could, could uh, get some little discussion going, at least on some of the themes. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to start something. Do you want to... Yeah. Yes, um, that's right. Anyone leave? Exits there. Exits there. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think there's one... I'd like to, I'd yeah. Quite like to, I'd quite like to draw together, if I may, um, the, the last presentation that probably only a few of you heard, from David Dunster, and Cedric's presentation, both of which in many ways were quite along the same lines, but, what, but I wouldn't like to go further than saying that. But what I would like to mention about these is that there was, I think, a, a general insinuation, both in terms of Chicago and how it how it actually evolved, and in terms of what Cedric has just been saying, that there is, in this development of, of any kind of uh, urban configuration, there's always some, some, there's an enormous amount of ad hocery. I mean, one, one never knows quite uh, how it comes out. And yet, you know, in terms of what David was saying, there was the Burnham trying to really produce things, and we weren't quite sure how sincere Burnham was or not, but that's a question. But in terms of well, what Cedric has been saying, he very early on introduced and rather dismissed quite quickly the notion of truth. You know, well, this is maybe something that we are interested in, but, but are we? Now, in terms of the, in terms of the city, what, when, where do these things that one that all sorts of people with different views believe in. I mean, how do they come into the city? Is the city uh, a, a model for ad hocery, or does something come through? Now, I mean, I do think that both of these two talks have been sort of insinuating maybe Cedric more on a theoretical level, and David on this occasion in a more specific level. Uh, that, that there was sort of a combination of some of those things, people wanting to do things, but on the other hand, living in a consumerist ad hoc kind of context, what can one do? But I mean, I just, it'd be quite nice to get you both, in fact, if Dennis looks sort of rather meek and mild at the back there, but uh, it'd be quite nice to get you both, if, if possible, to get into saying something about that. I'll, I'll go first. I don't mean to laugh. I wasn't suggesting in my, my brief history of, of the city that uh, um, it was a, a product of ad hocery and, and sort of, um, oh, well, it happens to be here, let's make it work. What I was suggesting that in uh, almost every age and every instance, it was a very uh, particular partial group, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, reason, if not aim, oriented, oriented group that, that caused the city to grow as it did at the time. The, the whole nature, for instance, if you take London, the whole nature of the growth of, of uh, parliamentary democracy um, moving from, from uh, the court, whether it was uh, uh, outside London at, at Worcester or was traveling around the country to, to a sort of a, a representative thing of the people, long after uh, Runnymede and all that, but if you take 
uh, Simon de Montfort saying we must have elected, you know, squires of the shires and they must meet somewhere. And the moving to the chapter house at, at, at uh, the first House of Parliament was chapter house at, 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 at um, <coughs> Westminster Cathedral. Then they didn't like it because they, they, they started uh, dividing into, into two or three parties and it was circular. There was 200 people but it was still circular and they had to go up to the lectern. And they moved to St. Stephen's, uh, uh, St. Stephen's. And then the, the, the business of, of finding it useful because this, this wasn't happening in France, which a, a large part of which we still owned at the time. Uh, um, what's it called? Tuscany or whatever. Uh, <laughs> well, is that Italy? Yes. Well, then it must be somewhere where they make claret. I don't go to France very often. I can't understand a word. No, Burgundy. They make Burgundy. Claret. Claret. Bordeaux. Around there. Anyhow. Somewhere. Normandy. Normandy, probably. Over there. It was Eleanor of Aquitaine. Good Lord. Don't you? We will spend, I mean, second language was French in those days, but the point about the business of getting representatives together, they couldn't do it in Germany and France, too long, and all those rivers. And <laughs> <laughs> the, it, London was a good place for that. Now, that was long before the centralization caused by, by the Romans, but the usefulness of London at that time was a, was, was a legislative, you know, embryonic, democratic usage of government, not to do with a warring tribe occupying the country, which London was useful for the Romans. And, and there have been various levels at which time, I have no doubt that Travelstead and, and those funny fellows from Canada with their uh, Canary Wharf think London is useful to them, you know, plague on them, I can care less. But the, the, at any one time, I think there is enthusiasm. So I don't think it's just sort of happened. The whole growth of the newspaper industry, quite apart from the fact of, of tea and coffee, uh, merchandising and then selling, was, was another thing that, that uh, required a physical convenience. Now, you tell me what the, that's why I put those signs up, you see. You have to. If you're talking about architecture, you have to talk about distances and, and sizes and occupation. And then you get all that nonsense about putting a spine back in London because it's such an awful place to build all those great big buildings. So we'll, we'll get the sportsmen of the world to justify some damn fool grant of an Olympic city and someone can build the drains and a, and a bus station. You know, I mean, it's the wrong way round. At any one time, the justification of a city is, is the enthusiasts who find it as it is useful. Not the other way around. I don't think anyone uh, owes the city a living. Now, Meek and Miles, speak up. No, come down here. Come down here. We're a little group now. <laughs> uh, my night is 30 years ago. I think in Chicago the, the thing was definitely energy um, that kept it going. You're right there. I think what, what they were concerned, what the promoters of the Chicago plan were concerned to do was actually to make enormous amounts of money out of what I think was probably the largest construction, what was probably the largest sector of the economy, which was construction. construction yeah. And it's very interesting that in the case of Chicago, which was very fast in its development, that uh, a major part of its economy was to do with building itself. What they never wanted to pay for um, were those things that the Metropolitan Board of Works paid for here. That was, that was a big problem. Who paid for the sewers? Uh, they would sooner have people die from typhoid in the 19th century by allowing the ship from the Chicago River to go into the source of fresh water in Michigan than actually do a proper job and reverse the flow of the river. And they only did this after a calamity. I think the other, the other thing is the spacing of the kind of really significant events in the city. That is that when uh, this was remarked by the Urban Government Commission. When the city is really rich, 
it never pays for cheap housing. Mm. And when yeah. it's really poor, that's when it builds roads. Because that's when there's a mass of unemployed around, and you can get them cheap, and the cheapest thing they can all do is build roads. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, it, that's, that's quite right, you see, whereas it, 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 London's history of roads and spacing was, was largely caused by, by rivalry between the grandees and the, and the throne trying to get together and uh, a little bit later on, but long before the drains, a little bit later on, these, these, these annual illnesses that were occasioned by the filth of the Thames. So you get, you get the court moving down to Greenwich, you get them moving to Windsor, you get Northumberland House, uh, you get all the, all the dukes, Somerset House, Northumberland House, Shandos House, all, all around Duke of Dorset, Dorset, being available at the court, whether it was at Westminster or, or at St. James's, and yet being far enough away to put their, their town demean round. So that the, the roadway really was a thing from the, you know, from the Tower of London, which really was a Roman institution uh, originally. I mean, they, they, this is good, this hum. Uh, and that and, and the link with the French influence, which was long after, uh, you see, nor, he didn't expect to win. Uh, William the Conqueror. It was only because he hit the other man in the eye. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, it's true. He didn't expect to win. So, I mean, the, the, the whole business about the, the, the whole thing about the, uh, the, the real French influence in, in London, in this country, came another century later. The whole business about building, um, uh, you're, you're, you're into the 13th, 12th, if not 13th century, the whole thing of building. French style at, at, at Westminster Abbey, as opposed to the longest nave in, in Europe at Winchester, where Alfred had been, was meant that you needed a link between the Tower of London and, 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 and the Palace of Westminster. See, now if you hang the villains on the way at Tyburn, because you couldn't get much closer down to the river, I mean, the, the strand was on a buff or bluff or whatever it was and then it was marsh but then you know you had to turn in to oxford street but i think the other aspect but it, it was a different thing from the chicago the cities, there are two things most of them are bipolar they have two poles buddha and pesh berlin yeah i love yeah. the buddha and pesh oh, there's that's a bridge <laughs> between them yeah. as well the court <laughs> at, at uh, westminster and the city of london and there's also the second thing is that there's a wall which has to do with taxes, most significantly in the expansion of European cities. By well, European, inside yeah. Inside or outside. American cities don't seem to me to have either of those things, except for the Spanish cities in California, which are very, very small. That's right. And, and St. Oh, Mary's, oh, which, oh, yeah. Which is fair, yeah. <laughs> Isn't there something also about the, the idea of the river which connects Chicago and London? In both cities, the, the river is central, but in many ways detrimental, and, and there are connections in that the river, in both cases, the source of effluence. But in Chicago, the, the little bit, the, the spit, was cut through and in the same way that the Isle Dock effectively was by the docks. And that somehow the, the, this ambiguity towards the river, in both senses, was very, um, you know, was, was, was a very important factor in the city. Where in, in, in Europe, the existence of the city on the river was of crucial importance. In, in the making of the Middle Ages, Richard Southern points out that the three centers of uh, early medieval civilization were the boundary of the Seine, the boundary of the Rhine, and he says, and perhaps we may add, patriotic reasons, the boundary of the Thames. And, and somehow the Rhine was, was very important in, in, in Franco German culture, the Seine, obviously, in French culture. And somehow the position of the river in London has always been ambiguous. Absolutely, right. absolutely right with London. I'm not so sure about Chicago. We'll come back. No, London is so because the, the convenience of the city had 
had been, as I said earlier, the convenience was that they'd overcome the river. They were primary people at the south end of the country, wanted to get to the north end. That's why London happened. The convenience of the river as far as do docks went was, um, I mean, the first, the first enclosed dock in London was St. Catherine's Dock, but it was a long way up. And, and in fact, they, they very often had to pull the boats even then, although the draft was very slow. And it was a wonderful place, you know, several centuries later for, for the Dutch to raid. Because, you know, they, they could get them down at Muckingford on the first bay, you know, at Raynham. So I agree with you on that. It was, it was a real, it, it, was, it wasn't a convenience, the river, to the growth. But I think it's because, one, it wasn't a very big river, and isn't a very big river, and it wasn't leading anywhere. You see, there's no harbour at Oxford. You see, if you think of the whole thing of, of the Rhine and the Seine, um, and, and uh, that is why, I suppose, that, that most of the trade, I mean, all the, um, the amazing thing, back to this place which isn't Tuscany but Bordeaux, all the wine imports, and we were the biggest boozers, I mean, centuries ago, came into Bristol because they, they were deep keeled boats. And they certainly couldn't fart around getting up the Thames, you know, with all the mud banks moving all the time. So all the, the and, and most of the wool was exported from Bristol, while, while London was still well, was very much the capital of this country. So it was that tra trade link, but it's, I agree, but Chicago, I don't know, you see, I don't know about that river, because I don't know how, how the, I know the railway lines were there, but why were the railway lines there? I mean, how did the grain and the beef get to Chicago in the first place? Was it the lakes? Yes. Or was it the river? No, it was the lakes. Yeah. The river was, the river was basically an extended harbour or docking. Facility. So it was and nothing, yeah. Yeah, one of the big arguments mm. that Vernon had uh, with the, not the authority, but the authority that had some responsibility that was highly divided, was that he wanted an outer harbour and they wanted to preserve harbours in, um, on the sound branch of the Chicago River. Which was further up. I mean, yeah. the, the front of Chicago was actually sold. Yeah. Yeah. Or South Chicago. Yeah. yeah. And I the know. So uh, County Met was developed um, in order to provide the external harbour for Got the stuff in yeah. the sound. So I think that the river, but the river was terribly important up to about 1910. And then, just at the point when they were introducing all the bridges that opened and made it easier. They didn't need it. Ceased. Yeah. It was very important. Yeah. The, the, the traffic figures on the river just dropped velocity. Yeah. And that's because they just shifted it south. Now, why they shifted it south, I don't know. Because they were filling in. I mean, they weren't filling in the river, but they were moving the... Well, they lake. had more. They had more. There was a lake at Canyon. What? There was a lake at Canyon. Yeah. Play around. That, yeah. that already existed. By that time, the connections to, I mean, they, the, the connect, the river connection, I think, Mississippi to, from the Mississippi to Chicago, was not important. No. Right. So that's rather ruined your Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Right, be more general. How about press a few? Another one. From you. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but perhaps I missed out a point that you would have liked me to cover. <laughs> can, we, can we encourage any more questions? Yes, I would. I'd like to ask Yeah. Uh, can, can you ever truly? treat London as a 18th city because if you look at it historically it's a fairly well defined which you've been through. Mm. Um, it starts off with palaces, pleasure gardens beside the river. Um, there are lots of bogs, marshes, so on, that get taken over by commercial usage. That usage is only there actually to support the city, to support those cities, I should say, to their three. Um, it treats the river as the backside. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's foul, it's disgusting. It turns its back on it. You get depression of the market, you get consumer foods and so on. We go to containerization, we do away with the docks. We've got derelict, redundant land, huge acres of it, um, <coughs> where there are sort of run down housing areas, there is poverty, there are all sorts of things tied up in that. There's a, there's a whole plenty of questions that could be raised by that. You then suddenly get these areas and this wonderful uh, government institute, well, instituted thing called the LBDC to develop this land. And from being something that turns it back to the river, we're suddenly looking to, with our fronts to the river, with no infrastructure there to support it. And isn't that actually the root of the problem? And don't you find that you know, Pali's Tower or Pai's Tower or whatever is sort of eight miles up it? Well, I mean, I, I, the thing I quoted for was, was I, I mean, actually, I think most, well, a great number of cities have had it. Um, I don't think we, uh, we, don't, we don't owe them a living. And I, I find this, that's why I quote those things, I find this uh, effort to keep London going in the, in the mind's eye of, of a sort of totally balanced way, the best way of life, absolutely absurd. Um, uh, and, and what is probably, as always happens in this country, it's going to be a minor genteel disaster that is, is going to make us chain, change our policy towards uh, reinforcing the, the worthwhileness of London. And I personally think that will be health. And I think that we'll find out quite soon that there is no way that we can afford to maintain the sewers in London and that we have made no allowance at all for, for uh, which, I mean, the, the technology exists, et cetera, et cetera, but we made no allowance for the fragmentation of, of services, removing human waste and supplying drinkable water, because we've centralized it. So I think that I uh, answered your question about, uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think London, I don't think we owe it a living, and I don't think it will, for all that long, be able to provide a living for people. Because in fact, the, the, most, the lowest paid and the hardest worked cannot afford to live in London, yet they're required to run the buses, run the tubes, do the laundries, collect the rubbish, uh, and, and serve in restaurants for people who can still afford to live in London. So, answer your question, no, I don't, I don't understand about the three, I mean, there are other cities that grew out of three cities, or two or three. I mean, Strasbourg is, is case in point. Uh, it was two, but I don't think that matters in the history of the thing. If, if your point was, uh, do we think London's had it? I mean, the south bank of the river, of course, was, was ideal at one time because, because the prevailing winds are southwest and, and used to come over cornfields and not over marshland, Eltham and Greenwich. Uh, were, were two key places where people went to, to avoid the plague. And indeed, uh, the king used to live in Greenwich and, and Francis Bacon, when he was, he was paymaster general, uh, used to have to pick the money up from the Tower of London and go over to, to Eltham. He, he got mugged several times at, at, at New Cross. And that's why he had his house just outside, outside the, the bridge into Eltham. And he, you know, they kept more money there. They got it when the muggers weren't out. And he paid, <laughs> but that was paying the royal court at, at Eltham. So, um, no, I, I agree with you. I don't, what? Eltham. Eltham. Plasto, do you? <laughs> Plasto. Uh, is that what you're saying? Uh, no, I don't think I don't think London's got much much of a future. I think, in fact, if you reversed if if you reverse the system of uh, of uh, the underground, particularly things like the Metropolitan and the Northern, and those, and I suppose the the Jubilee, and actually started picking up where they might by crossing join out into the hinterlands of of uh, uh, Hertfordshire and indeed sort of uh, Cambridgeshire and uh, what's the other one? North Essex 
and you ran the back in, you ran a series, and the same from the south. You, sat, you ran a series of spines in to, to preserve. Those people most disadvantaged would be people who lived in Whitehall, you know. They'd have the longest journeys, like living at Cot Fosters or Edgware at the moment. But it, 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 I think that may happen because the rails run. But I, I don't see, yes, I don't hold out anything. I mean, may become, may become a, a sort of uh, haunt for ha well-heeled, uh, hardy histrophiles who like to come and have a look at the end of the empire. Um, but even now, we can't afford to open the, the uh, museum doors to them. So you have to turn the whole city into a museum and charge entrance by, by high transport at, at the gates to the city. Yeah. I want, carrying on from that, if it is the essence of London, for instance, to inevitably disintegrate and um, decentralize, and actually break down into war factories, okay, you get this thing called Canary Wharf, which rises out of the ground, mm. but it's, that is an infrastructure that's been put in for it rightly or wrongly through various funds where there are new drains, new mm -hmm. ditches and so on. And that can rise and it has an infrastructure, whereas there are other bits of, if you take South of Westminster, whatever, with mm -hmm. decaying systems. Um, you're putting in, patching in um, networks of rail lines and so on, and you're taking the existing railways, you're taking mm -hmm. tube networks and so on, and you're patching them together into an ad hoc system. I mean, the whole thing is to ultimately to do with the disintegration without any kind of consensus of the no. rule plan. No, I think I, you're right. I mean, I, I think you can um, uh, go back onto things like that first plan. I mean, that, that was long before Abercrombie. That, that Abercrombie was 39, 40, this was 29. Um, or or, or you, can, you can plan for disintegration. I tell you, Canary Wharf isn't all that self-sufficient. Otherwise, they wouldn't be uh, sort of offering monies to get the Jubilee Line running there. And, and, and their, their drains are, are that self-sufficient. They haven't, they haven't put money into infrastructure. They thought it'd be there. They thought the rest of the city, uh, i.e. the city of London, a square mile, would be so delighted to have them. And to some extent, they have been, like they built that link to bank. That, that, that they would provide the infrastructure, you see. Because they, cause they pulled the same, well, I won't say pull the same trick, I'm sure they're honest, true, and Canadian thick stupid. Uh, but, um, they, they, you know, they certainly did do these sort of deals in Hawaii and, and Toronto with, with great success, but I don't, I, I really don't mind what happens to Canary Wharf, but I don't think we should, justify its being there by saying, now we'll, we'll introduce, you know, e eternal debt to the ratepayers of London to have the Olympics there, because in infrastructure it'll put a spine back into the spineless part. <laughs> it all seems the wrong way back, wrong way round. You don't put a spine, I mean, I, perhaps the spine isn't the very first bit of the embryo that grows, but it's pretty early on, certainly before the mouth. <laughs> I, I, I'm intrigued because it's, it's actually the third attempt. It's not, it's, it's not the first attempt, it's the third attempt to put the Olympics on the island. So. Uh, uh. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, there is, there's an awful thing, you know, like nature abhors a vacuum. Architects abhor space, which they think they can do something with. <laughs> Don't they? I mean, they, <laughs> I mean it's, just, it's just, I mean, we'll cover this next week. There was an Olympic suggestion for, for the area I dealt with in, in uh, what well, dealt with, I think they may be sacking me at this very moment, but hope to deal with in Hamburg. The same sort of thing. On a more general question, and I, somebody else ought to join in on this. Mm. There is this thing about, you know, the Londoners have traditionally turned their back on the river um, for obvious reasons. That have been moves that are constantly moves to reverse that situation. I mean, is that a future? In that? Well, I have an answer you say, let someone else. Can you hear him? 
the future of the river. London's, London, I start what I said, speaks for London has sort of traditionally turned their back on the river. I mean, I don't actually agree with that, but that's what you say. And is there some, and certainly there are at the moment, is there some way of reversing that? I mean, one, one thing I ask, well, I would ask you is why? I mean, uh, but let someone else. What about London River? Yeah. That that I, I think it I think it can die terribly gracefully, but I don't think anyone will serve me in my favourite restaurant in fifty years' time. I'll have to cook it myself, and it'll have been turned into a, you know, a joy. Just look, only the rich can spend three hours cooking their meal, eating it, and then paying for it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I I don't I don't think it's had it, but I mean. It, it's, uh, it, it, well, the river was a convenience. I mean, it's very good to find a big, cheap, clean sewer. And that's what it was for hundreds of years. And, and there were lot, yes, you know, and there were lots of towns which died because they tried to use their, their river as a sewer. But if you add to that, that post the palatial splendor of the Strand, the only housing schemes that have ever been put up on the river in London are Cheney Walk, uh, Strand on the Green, and a Chiswick Mall. Very small schemes of housing oh, schemes. What about Pimlico? Uh, doesn't actually front the river. I, I never actually addressed the river. There was I see always, what you mean. It was, yeah. was always locked by warehouses. Now, if if, if, if you take that as a point, no, and uh, I would defy anyone actually to find me a scheme outside of those three that actually fronted the river. There was always a barrier in between. The, uh, the next housing schemes that you do get are those in Westminster that stand back from the river with space between 
near the tower blocks and the river. And it's not until you get the sort of development of the 70s, late 70s, 80s, that you get and the various sort of um, commercial incentives that were being put on by the LDC and others. So you get housing. From well, I don't. I mean, Europe's largest block of flats is Dolphin Square still. In front of the river. It's well, it, I mean, there were f few things in front of it. There was hallways, stone the, yards. And they're all, they're all, there was always the, the, the warehouses, the cars, <coughs> and so on. Mm -hmm. Nobody actually built their houses next to this sewer. Now, well, that things have changed. We have started fronting the river. We've actually started putting buildings up, and buildings that actually are there to mm. addressing the river. And, well, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit rum, as far as I'm concerned, to, to talk about buildings fronting the river when you're when you're talking about eight million people, you're talking about <coughs> two thirds the population of Australia um, finding it convenient to live because a, a certain small proportion of them can look at a, at a stream that's that's less than a hundred yards wide. I mean, so what? I mean, you can. I mean, Hyde Park, you know, is, 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 you can front the trees. I mean, I don't understand. It's not much of an... It isn't a, it isn't a bloody marvellous river. It's not very wide. It's not very clean. What you're not, what you're not and it's tidal. What you're not quite acknowledging in this argument is really the, the historical significance as seen at a particular time uh, of the river itself. Because it's, it's quite clear that, I mean, water has not been traditionally or historically looked at as a good place to look at. It's seen as a danger area. And you've got to go into at least the, the 19th century and coming into the 20th century to romanticize the river. So once it's romanticized and seen as good, you don't, it's a bit too late to turn your whole turn the town around and say, this is the great thing and we all should love it. And we should all should look at it. I mean, I one's got to put it into a historical. Point, that's the point of view I'm trying to raise. Yes. If, um, I may not be doing it for a big world, but there are these incentives to do that. And it is a false that I think to create a centre out of a river <laughs> in a city where there is no centre. But that is what is often being tried, what is being provoked by a lot of people within. Well, it's still open for discussion whether it's the most desirable thing or not, even now. I mean, it's a, it might be a, a great amenity, it might not be conceived of as a great amenity, it might be something much quieter. I mean, even the view is a concept, you know, one wants the big view. But how many people with the big view, they, they really rather like the little window at the back, which is less of a big view. I mean, you find this sort of planning in Switzerland, away from the view. I mean, the river is in a Inevitably, a fundamental part of London. Why else would we have the Festival of Britain now? Because, it's because there was a site which was bloody cheap. No one wanted. It was the one place. It was the end of the war, and there were three railway stations, and, and there was very little car ownership. That's why. Yeah, we didn't it was Bristol Palace. No, but it, it, it was well serviced, well transited, well, well and it was central. It was, it was vacant. I mean, but I mean that, that's I mean I did I I I have yet to be convinced on on the importance of of a city as such having 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 a centre at the end of the 20th century. I don't understand what I mean. I mean, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles has managed without a centre very well. I agree. I'm, I'm Unless you take the nice Bannum definition that you know that it's it's 20 miles long and is under underwater for eight, eight, 12 hours a day. And it's called the beach. Is, is it possible with um, London sort of um, housing, sort of eel farming starting again on the East End at a large scale and power gen planning three power stations for London that there is going to be room for new artifacts of change that might come into London and therefore it will generate possibly not a city but so much as sort of the river as sort of generator of communities as such or whatever along the idea of artifacts of change, that things will relate to time, and things like that, from that. Well, no, I think that, that is, is possible. I, I certainly think that, that what I was trying to say was that, uh, um, perhaps I did say it, it had it, but <laughs> what I say is that no one owes the city a living 
and that cities very often grow through, through a, a, a rather clever, uh, interested group seeing an advantage. I don't feel that, that uh, a particular development of, of office blocks for international finance by a group that then halfway through bellyache about their purse being short and could we bail them out, being an interested group that have any significance in realisation as opposed to build it as a very good, I mean it is a, it, you're quite right, it's a marvellous place to import cheap uh, foreign brown coal to and fill it up with, with power stations because uh, the, the Trent has almost used up its water for power stations and it become, it become an enormous generating uh, plant for the country on, on, on safe uh, fuel, okay it's fossil fuel, we go through all that argument again uh, and, and, and the rest could be fish, could be, be roach and eel and, and fish farming just as you, the, the cheapest food in London for, for two centuries was oysters and they're now selling a, a, a quid each or more or whatever um, no, no, I agree. You know, if someone could find someone find something to do, to do with with pollution, which is still high in the Thames, you know, if they find find fish that would, doesn't matter whether they've got four heads and two tails, and, <laughs> uh, 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 that would feed off the effort. We won't spend all this money on on cleaning up the Thames. Absolutely agreed. Um, and, and that is it. So one looks at it in this funny valley that collects mists, that is protected against extremes of climate, that has a higher humidity than the neighbouring hills north and south of it, that has a river running through it, and a lot of derelict buildings with a few grandees who, who like to have W1 on their dress cards. Yes, and I agree, there may be, may be things. It could be all sorts of things. It could be a very good, uh, it could be a very good centre for for uh, you know promoting uh, um, danger-free skills in demolition. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> thought, well, can, you know, controlled atomic explosions. <laughs> <laughs> we've got all the. I mean, we've got we've got uh, you know. Silicon Valley up towards Oxford, they can now measure the things. Oh, it could be a, it could be an enormous workshop. I mean, no, but it's interesting. You see, the one thing that British Rail makes money out of is transporting nuclear waste to to uh, um, thingy thing. They keep mentioning the name because it's always meant to be obscene. Um, Scarsdale or whatever it is, well, Skemmersdale. What's it called now? They keep changing the name. Anyhow, we're the biggest destroyers of the world's nuclear waste. Boats are coming in from Japan with the junk. Send it to England. They've got a very, we have got a very good processing plant, and it goes through Brixton and all the. I mean, the trains go at night, don't they? Those big white things. What's it called? Sellafield. What was it called? Windscale. Windscale. That's right. You used to be able to get uh, postcards of the beach at Windscale, having a lovely time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, with the second head taken out. <laughs> but, uh, oh no, no, I do agree that, that that's the way to look at it. I mean, it also, you see, because of the reduction of industry, rather like Birmingham and Spaghetti Junction there, because of the reduction of industry uh, in, in the London Basin, enormous reduction, uh, the water table's rising again. Now, it used to be one of the best artesian basins in, in well, in Europe. And, and up till 1947, uh, no, just before the Festival of Britain, 49, the uh, fountains in Trafalgar Square were, were entirely uh, driven by God. I mean, gravity fed. I mean, it was artesian basin. You turn the tap, like that. You had to control them. That's how high the water table was in those days. Now it's, it's, it's rising again, and uh, it's very, that's another interesting thing. You see, as industry goes, if you take the removal of industry from Birmingham, um, uh, when, when the post office was uh, thrown to the dogs, oh, what's the word, privatised, um, 
that they, they, they took a responsibility of all the uh, telecom cables underground to the tower in Birmingham, which is similar to the London one, except there are no offices right, and no machines right around it, sort of concrete thing. That whole passageway now, full of cables, they, the British Telecom are having to pump 24 hours a day because the water table's risen, because the industry's gone in that area. They haven't allowed for that. It wasn't tanked because <laughs> it was above the water table. They've inherited that. You see, so in fact, it depends how much has been put underground, what, what sort of bill you take through taking out the industry above ground. But again, London is, is worth looking at on, on that score. Yes, absolutely. Sandra, um, could, could, could I, I tell us how you have it from your... Some, some might deem you lovely, Chris. Oh, well, uh, well, what I wanted to ask is, um, do you have a view on um, Smithson's New Ways for London? You know, we published it in Whitefriars Press, don't as it was ago, and, 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 and it was a thing which is very unpopular, you know, in today's, um, today's thoughts and all that. And I just wondered whether, whether you'd like to sort of, do, do you have a recollection of, of, of what that thesis was. This is dreadful, Chris. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember that. It wasn't. I. I no, I don't. I'm sorry. Was it in Upper Case? You mean? Case. Yeah. I don't even remember it. You, you, you were top. You, 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 you were the instigators of Upper Case. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember it. New ways for London. What you see, it might have been. It might have been one of those things that 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 Alison Peter did that I didn't like, and therefore oh, I don't right. remember it. Right, that's why I want to. Ask I know, but the, yeah, but the, uh, yeah, but the job is I obviously didn't dislike it enough to remember. <laughs> yeah. I'm coming, and and there was an enormous thing that wasn't Oxford Street, but went that way, I've got it, and Pennington, yes, yes, no, I really thought that was, that was bombastic band-aid, you're right, yeah, no, I, I've got it now. Mm. Oh, no, no. I still think you'd have had the Notting Hill riots with that scheme. Because that, that's what it... Well, you remember, I think one of the key, key moments, one of the important moments in urban planning in London was the Notting Hill riots. When people... No, it's really... You remember them. I mean, I... I the point was that everything that was about... Now, OK, you didn't have the roads or anything, but everything was about revitalization and re, uh, re, what do you do when you bring oxygen in here? Revigorating the city was proven wrong. Now, they haven't got a motorway, but they got damn near else, including government money, and they still had the riots. And what was misunderstood then, which is no criticism of your scheme, but what was misunderstood then was that one of the values of... No, 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 I, I remembered it now. <laughs> but I tell you, it's, it's lack of brandy. I don't remember it quicker. Never. It was a different flavour, which was a yeah. at that point 
Well, it was. And, and what's more, it came, I, funny enough, it came after Serge Cadley's High Paddington. Yes. Remember? Yes. But, yes. but, it, but it implied that it might have to feed that sort of development. Uh, uh, what? Uh, Serge Cadley, uh, absolutely. He's still alive, he's teaching in uh, Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the no, what, what struck me as interesting, what, what made me think at the time of Notting Hill Rights, because I, do you remember the Reverend George Clark and, and his, I was one, I, I was one of the bleeding hearts. I used to go around sort of saying, well, these strip peas. Yeah, but the, the, thing, the thing about Notting Hill Rights, what was misunderstood, which is marginal to your question, was that if you made London all right, then people would stay there and be happy. What was misunderstood, that one of the roles of London, and still is the role of London, is it's a launching pad for something better for those who could not exist anywhere else if they weren't in London first. That's always been the story. The Irish would always tell you that. But it's been ignored. But London, it, all this business about, oh, well, look at the people in the cardboard boxes. I agree, that's horrific. But the point about a city is that, in fact, you can live in a cardboard box. I, I mean, this is exaggerating. You can exist in a cardboard box at Westminster under the arches because the arches keep the rain off and there's a public lavatory by the side and you might be able to touch someone for 50 pence. You can't do that in High Wycombe. Now, the point about London and the, and the, and the riots and the, and the whole business of, of the Notting Hill riots is that it was assumed by the do-gooders, of which I was one, that, that the the persons from the West Indies who were highly discrimi discriminated against then really wanted to live in London. Did they buggery? It was their first foothold into somewhere where they might get a job. And, and they quite rightly moved out. And that's one of the things, back to your things as what could London provide? It can provide a springboard. Whether you finish up in London or not doesn't matter. Therefore, the people in Notting Hill Gate couldn't care a damn whether the front door is painted yellow, red, or is peeling paint, as long as there's a lock on it. And, and, and the equivalent well-heeled version could be the AA, where, where, where a majority of the students haven't got the slightest intention of staying in London for the rest of their life, but it's a bloody good springboard, intellectually, and that's all right, too. And people must see cities as that, not as places that require a population to pay the, 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 you know, the funding of the motorway that feeds their front door with chippo crisp trucks. <laughs> because they won't. They wait for half an hour. So the traffic being slow, I haven't got a car. As long as the chips are at McDonald's, I don't mind whether they arrived on time or not. You see? So the, the point, point is that, that I think, and again, it's no direct criticism, but the point is you can't do a, a, a tabula rosa of economic, uh, socio-environmental, engineering, architecto, planning networks that you then overlay, whether they be uh, telephone systems or, or roadways and things, and say, that's all this ugly old face needs. In fact, it probably needs, you know, a little tablet and think, that's your day. But we'll, we'll you know, and the little tablet is, 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 a peaceful, is a peaceful, painless death. Uh, for, for those who, I mean, some, some very rich people spend an awful lot of agony and, and time and energy living in the depths of Wiltshire. Well, you can make it happier to die in, in, in Whitehall or something. I mean, <laughs> so I, it's, it's on, and that's why I quoted the, the road. I mean, you know, it, it, it may be unthinkable now, but the idea of Rome dying and collapsing, because he did die, he didn't, he didn't stay until the American tourists arrived or, 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 <laughs> or Turner with his watercolors. And it died, it, it died, it went. Nothing. 
and uh, couldn't imagine it. But long before the end, back to the business of, of deaths of cities being in, in primarily in the heart of those who are there, the discontent of those who are there, is that um, I don't know. If, I don't know if it was Brunelleschi. It was the Brunelleschi. Oh, thank God he's not here. Brunelleschi expert. Wait a minute. <laughs> Anyhow, did he do the doors of the round thing as well? Yeah. What's the round? Who did the doors of the round one Kibati. with a hole through at the top? The doors were Kibati. And there is one, one of the sides is Brunelleschi and the other side is Kibati. Anyhow. No, 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 I'm talking, I'm talking about the brown building. What's it called? With a hole in the top, the rain comes through. No. No, the Pantheon. Yes, the Pantheon. <laughs> the Romans did those doors. Yeah, you see, you're all jumping centuries. The Romans did those doors. The, the bronze was taken off those doors, melted down, and turned into cannon for the citadel in the, in the uh, uh, you know, where, where my church, I mean, my ex-church resides, the, the what's it called? Holy See, of the Rome, St. Peter, turn it, to turn it on, on own citizens. It's not just going to be people, you know, sort of trying to get a, um, a heritage grant to put the glazing back in the Midland Bank of Lutchen's favorite building in Manchester. It's, you know, we'll see. So, I mean, I... It's not that I say it's had it. I do say that I, I do feel that I, I, I'm depressed if, if, a, if a vital, worthwhile element of our profession, called the architecture profession, spends too much time at the elastoplast tin. Um, but one has to, has to make valid reasons for this, this point. That's why I welcome these interjections, these questions, discussion. <laughs> do, do, do we have any more questions? Funnily enough, I think a lot of that scheme could well have been applied to Frankfurt, but at the places like Frankfurt, but at the time it wasn't seen in need. You see, Frankfurt have now put in the most elaborate high-pressure steam thing, which makes even Manhattan look, look rather feeble, and another tube network. And, and the your scheme, which is coming back now, a little bit. I, I, I don't in Frankfurt then. <laughs> okay, in somebody else's backdrop? Yeah. That's right. That's a call Limby. Not in my backyard. Okay. I was, I was just going to say that the very first, talk, talking about people moving to London and sleeping in boxes, but the very first poor laws, which had something, some similarity to those kind of, kind of conditions, were in about 1520. They were brought really? up. Really? Yes. And the, the, they actually were a response to that kind of problem. So it's been going That's on for quite a long yeah. time, and the city has been, as you said, it has been sort of uh, developing with that well, kind of thing. Fat. Yeah. Desperate launching fan. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, and this is only the middle. There's more to come <laughs> next week. You've been, You've been warned. Thank you.